Hey YouTube, welcome back to another History Teacher Reacts video. Mr. Terry is a continuing my search for historical knowledge found here on the internet. All right, today's video is the result of last week's patrons pick poll and our awesome patrons voted for this video, which is why did the Great Schism happen? And this is by Knowledgeia. This is a great question. I was thinking about this a little bit more. I, you know, I teach this every year and, and just some basics about the Great Schism, the kind of split between the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church and, and a little bit about the... Um, the relationship and how it kind of deteriorated between like the Pope and the Patriarch. But there's definitely a deeper level that I want to learn about other than just the fact that these churches have grown distant from each other over the centuries um, since the basically the fall of the Roman Empire, the Western Roman Empire. So um, excited to check this out today. So thank you, patrons. If you'd like to vote in future polls, uh, definitely consider joining our Patreon. It starts about a dollar a month, and all pledge levels can uh, be able to vote in polls as well as get other fun merch and stuff like that. Also, if you haven't um, followed us over on Twitch, we do a lot of fun things. Even if you're not a gamer, uh, one thing we do over there is watch parties where we're able to, um, through Amazon and Twitch's integration, because they're owned by a parent company, um, we're able to watch historical movies together and we chat about it. We have a lot of fun. But uh, if you didn't know we do that, definitely uh, check that out. There's a link to Twitch down below if you're not a Twitch member. It's a free thing to sign up for. But if you do like gaming, that's definitely a great place to go to as well. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Hey, the video link is down below. Make sure you support the original supporters. Knowledge it is awesome stuff. I think you, you will really like their stuff. The Great Schism of 1054, also known as the East-West Schism, <clears throat> marks the official separation of the Western Church based in Rome from the Eastern Church of Constantinople. While right. it is generally declared that the division of the churches came in 1054, many historians actually believe that there was not one specific event of the schism. Hmm. but many that eventually added up to a breaking point. I thought it was mostly just like the excommunication of each other when they kind of did that story. I want to make sure I get that detangled. Um, I usually teach this, by the way, in the context of the Crusades because the Crusades are going to start in 1095, 1096. So about, you know, 40, you know, 40 years or so. So kind of within a generation here and seeing the, the Pope, Pope Urban's response to this to the call for help from the east as kind of a way to heal the schism so i i found that that's a good way to teach this is put that in that context of the crusades which comes shortly after conflict within the churches of christianity can be seen as far i love the hagia sophia century even. my favorite building the events of the quarto deciman controversy can be regarded as potentially the start of what would become the great schism when the i gotta be reminded of what this was to excommunicate a group of churches throughout Asia Minor in 190. And I am happy to say that this video is sponsored by The Great Courses Plus. Ooh. As a history geek, I seek to know more about history every day. And Me too. Of your passions, Dude, I what's that place? Make learning... Whoa, what is that place? This place up here are the people standing. Let me know in the comments. I want to go there. Our primary goal in life. <clears throat> the Great Courses Plus is a subscription on-demand video learning service with top-notch lectures and courses from top professors from great universities and other the big, The big brain stuff. Through your subscription, you get access to a huge library of over 11,000 video lectures about anything that interests you. Science, math, history, literature, or even how to cook, play chess, or become a better photographer. One of my favorite lectures is about the decisive battles of world history. A different event could have greatly influenced our lives today. That's usually what I like to do with military history is decisive things, not just you know, trial. You can everything. This channel, <laughs> Too hard to do that. You can also learn new things by clicking on my link in the description <clears throat> and subscribing to The Great Courses Plus. Cool. Pope Victor I, hoping to settle the debate between whether Pesha or Easter should be celebrated on the 14th of yeah. Nisan or on the following Sunday, tried to do so by overextending his papal authority to excommunicate the Corno Decimans, which were those Christians who refused to observe the Lord's Supper on a Sunday. Hmm. While most agreed with the celebrating of Pesha on Sunday, 
Many bishops strongly reprimanded the Pope for his actions and were in complete disapproval of his effort to claim supremacy over all Christianity. Mm. The Quarto Decimans utterly... So you could see in, I mean, you could see in early Christianity how still a lot of the expectations are still... and are, are just, I don't know, <clears throat> rules, whatever. It's still very much up in the air and very debated. In early Christianity, there was not much unity. It was very specific... A lot of varied beliefs in Christianity. You, you know, beliefs of Christianity don't really get solidified much more till uh, much further after this. Um, so, yeah, I could see how there would be a lot of confusion, a lot of dissent, or just disagreement more than anything um, about certain things like that. By the way, the, they're talking about like the Easter. Um, you know, one of the one of the biggest things that was different in the Eastern and Western Church <clears throat> was the emphasis on uh, the 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 most important holiday. Like for the West, it was Christmas, and in the East, uh, in the in Orthodox Christianity, it was more focused on um, Easter, and that's always an interesting thing. Their excommunication, but when the first Council of Nicaea rolled around in three, are we calling it Nicaea now? Every Not Christian Nicaea. Church okay. became required to celebrate Easter on the same day. Dude, those hats. Sunday. Another topic great covered hats. at this council was the Nicaea Creed which is a statement of faith used by a variety of Christian denominations today. Now, in Nicaea, which is always what I was called, maybe it was called actually Nicaea back then, um, they didn't agree on a lot of things. There, it, it showed, the, the, the council here, how varied the beliefs of Christianity were. They were all over the place. Some on major questions about Christ and was, was he a person, was he a god, was he both, what is the... The, the Trinity, all of these sorts of things, um, and just really coming to, to trying to get to some kind of consensus of some things. It was very difficult, and they couldn't agree on stuff. Because the Western Church felt the need to change the creed and add the Filioque Clause. What's that? Without bothering to consult the Eastern Church leaders, the West tweaked the words of the Nicene Creed, which was an important part of divine liturgy, and still is. The original ver Shriek, wait. version included a portion saying, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I mean, that that's a very vague thing. It doesn't it doesn't have any kind of agreement on, you know, religiously on like who who God is, who is the Father, and all that kind of stuff. A lot of the deeper questions that were very divisive at this time. It's very vague. So it seems like what's happening here at Nicaea was they're just making the most broad of belief statements, and it seems like there's still going to be a lot of wiggle room, and there was for for you know centuries. The Church in Rome, however, decided to add the phrase "and the Son." After who proceeds from the Father? Wait, wait, wait. What? Let's compare the two again. So, seeds from the Father, and then they change from the Father and the Son. Add the phrase "and the Son" after who proceeds from the Father. To the east, not. Is that? I mean, is that just to to avoid the issue of saying or or to, to in Christian history they believe that. Uh, Christ and God are the same person. Is that what that is kind of doing there? That seems like that might be a way to kind of get out of having to make a statement on that. Was this done without their approval, but it was complete heresy. Both mm. today's Catholics and Orthodox Christians agree with this statement. But the okay. addition of and the son to the Nicene Creed seems to utterly contradict this shared belief. Mm. The issue appears to be theological. But yeah. could potentially be more of a translation problem. <coughs> the East, who use Greek translations, had every right to see the West's change as heresy. Get the hand. Because in Greek, it would be. It's the correct way to hold a pencil, by the way. The translation saying who proceeds from the Father compares to the original Greek version and essentially refers to the one true source of the Holy Spirit and can really only be interpreted along the lines of saying originates from. The Latin translation used by the West, however, uses the wording quia patre procedit. This is where the discord seems to stem from. The East sensibly was infuriated by the addition of the filioque, because to imply that both the Father and Son were the source of the Holy Spirit 
was grossly irresponsible and incorrect. Hmm. But due to the translation differences and apparent disconnect of understanding between the East and West at the time that the Nikian Creed was changed, many from the Western Catholic side aim to settle this argument with the explanation that, using the intention of the Latin translation, the West only meant to add on to the statement by clarifying that the Holy Spirit can only exist alongside the Father and Son, not that both are the creator or source of the Holy Spirit, which would indicate that the Spirit is of lesser status than the Father and Son. Hmm. Still, even though the addition of the Filioque could arguably be valid in terms of its meaning, there was another reason that the East was wildly disapproving. To grasp why, you first have to understand the chain of events that occurred during the creation of the Nikian Creed. True. Yeah, I mean, that's that's good to see that. The Nikian, Council of Nikia, Nicaea, um, such a such a big thing that the history of Christianity has kind of um, pointed to as like, this is in a lot of ways when like Christianity becomes Christianity in a way, uh, because the first kind of... It, attempt at trying to unify things but already you could tell how vastly disagreeing people were even on things that may seem to some as just semantics it's just arguing about words um, rather than the theology itself but and then you also have the multiple languages that are going on in the east they're using greek and the west they're using latin and a lot of differences can happen here so i think i think it's almost been taught much more that nicaea in the council there provided more um, that there were more agreements than than we think, when it really was not the case. It, 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 they did not agree on much. The first event of extreme relevance is the Council of Nicaea, of course. This was the council in 325, That's at the which big one. the original Nikim Creed was written, with both the East and West in attendance, although no mention of the Holy Spirit's procession was made. Just Next avoiding it. 381 was the Council of Constantinople, including only the East. At the Council mm. of Constantinople, the Eastern Church made some adjustments to the original Nikim Creed. But and, but without the West being there, is that kind of what their deal is? They're like, they don't really care about the West anymore. They're already starting to see themselves as different, or they maybe they think they're more legitimate than what the Western Church has to say. That is technically where they added the portion of the creed which addresses the procession of the Holy Spirit. The creed remained known as the Nikim Creed, in reference to the original, but it is important to note that it is actually not the original contents of the creed that is used today, mm. and that was changed in Latin translation. That fact becomes immensely applicable at the East-West Council of Ephesus in 431, where Canon VII was established to say, the Holy Council decrees that no one should be permitted to offer a different creed of faith, or in any case, to write or compose another than the one defined by the Holy Fathers who convened <laughs> in the city of Nicaea. Can't change it. in itself may not seem completely damning for the West, until you add the fact that the Council President, St. Cyril of Alexandria, also declared, Dude, he's got a bowl hat. any change whatsoever in the creed of faith, drawn up by the Holy Nikim Fathers. We do not allow ourselves or anyone else to change or omit one word or syllable in that creed. Nevertheless... But, but did they say, though, like, you know, if you were to read on with that, if they read more, it does also say, you can't change it unless deemed by another council, like, that everybody's involved with, or, hey, this is things infallible forever? Like, you can't always, you can't just put something like, hey, no one can change it without the approval of you know, all the different groups that were maybe were there originally, and I see it. While St. Cyril's statement complicates matters, there remains one obscurity given the fact that the original creed was changed at the Council of Constantinople. This begs the question of whether the East had already violated the new canon, or did they intend to reference the Constantinople update of the creed? What are the, the like you have the crucifix, um, but in orthodoxy, what are the other lines supposed to mean? I gotta, I gotta learn about that. And one of them's like, you know, diagonal, or yeah, like diagonal. But I don't know why that is. As the creed of faith drawn up by the Holy Nikim Fathers, the answer to that could be what makes or breaks the West's validity in their own adjustments of the creed. But either way, this discord remained a building tension. 
In addition to the unresolved issue, the East and West also could not seem to find middle ground on two other matters. The use of unleavened bread for the sacrament of communion, or whether clerics should remain celibate or not. On the subject of the bread dispute, the Western Church believed that unleavened bread should be used because of the fact that it is historically more likely that Jesus would unleavened bread at unleavened? the Last Supper. I want my leaven. On the point of celibacy, the West was determined to maintain that all priests this was a and big bishops yeah. must be celibate and unwed, yeah. while the East accepts married men to be right. ordained as priests. That was a big thing, too. One thing I... I teach about in the context of my classes too, are the, the, the theological differences or it's, it's not really theological. Well, it is, but just general d different differences and practices between the Western and Eastern church. And that definitely was a big one where you had this celibacy for the clergy in the West. So your priests, bishops, the Pope, you know, all that, they don't have families. They, they, uh, um, don't get married. Where in the East they do among the other things, like I said, the emphasis on Easter versus, uh, um, Christmas. Though they cannot remarry if their wife dies, and only bishops are required to stay celibate. Despite the lack of a direct oh, condemnation do. from okay. the West of married priests at the time of the Great Schism, the idea of complete celibacy was already being pushed on the one side. Potentially, these religious disputes could have been peacefully resolved if more effort had been made. But there were also political disagreements as well. Maybe most notably, the decision of whether the Pope should be of higher authority than any patriarch or other leader or not. The East Makes naturally sense. strongly disapproved of this statement. Yeah. And tensions begin to rise between the Pope and Patriarch of Constantinople. Though the East and West as a whole were responsible for the strain, the immediate events of the schism in 1054 might be soundly pinned on the contemporary Patriarch of Constantinople Michael Serralarius. Well, yeah, I mean, it doesn't help too with the, the whole power struggle when you have someone like Justinian who wanted the Roman Emperor, the Byzantine Emperor, to um, be the highest authority in religion too, like surpassing that of the Patriarch or the Pope or anything like that. So you have, have that um, way where, yeah, the, the political leader is also the religious leader. Um, but the Byzantine you know, Empire doesn't have that kind of political authority over in um, the West, although back in Justinian's day, that, that was kind of the case. He had expanded, and uh, at a time they had kind of retaken Rome, but that doesn't last all that long. Determined to maintain the Eastern Church's independence from being overrun by the West, Serralarius seemed almost intent on creating a schism. Initially, when the Byzantine Emperor Constantine IX Monomachus wished to align with the Pope and the Roman Empire against the threat of the Normans, Serralarius refused to cooperate whatsoever. In 1052, the Patriarch went as far as to demand that all Latin churches within his diocese use the Greek language and practices. Two years later, Pope Leo IX, Interesting. utterly resolute on negotiating an alliance with the Byzantines, sent three legates to Constantinople. Unwavered from his Stand options, down. Serralarius flat out refused to meet with the legates. As the situation continued to drag on with no clear end, the Pope died back in Rome and left one of his legates, Cardinal Humbert of Silva Candida, with a new idea. Saturday, July 16th, 1054, Cardinal Humbert marched into the Hagia Sophia Cathedral during divine liturgy and placed a charter of excommunication right on the main altar. I don't know, it was that, uh, it was that, like bold. I know there was the excommunication where they like excommunicate each other, but that's you put it in the biggest church in Christianity and just flat down a place where they don't even view you you as an authority, but dropping that right in there, right in their most sacred and, and a powerful center of worship. That's that's interesting. So what we see here is here in 1050s, um, you see a leader on both sides. Okay, the the sort of Latin side and the Greek side. Both trying to kind of claim 
some kind of more influence and authority over the other side. When, when before that it was more just, they were kind of doing their own thing. So you got the Greek church. It's like, no, you guys need to learn. He's using Greek and stuff like that. And they probably would have said, yeah, you need to do that. Cause the new Testament is written in Greek, right? Um, none of the original stuff there is, uh, you know, the, the Bible, it was in Greek and in Hebrew. And then, you know, having that claim over what they're using in the West, which was Latin because that's what the Romans, um, used. And, because that's the different language of the church. They use Latin exclusively over in the West and then uh, Greek over in the East. And then, yeah, and then <laughs> just, they're like, you're both in violation. So really trying to claim authority over places where they actually don't really have any authority when, it, when you think about it. They think they do, but they don't really. Officially excommunicating Patriarch Michael Serolarius and his church. In retaliation, Cerularius excommunicated the papal legates. No, you're excommunicated. To some oh, yeah? The Western Church along with them. You're Although excommunicated. this mutual excommunication was not the sole source of the Great Schism of 1054, it stands as the final straw for yeah, both sides. Yeah, for sure. And the marker of division of Christianity into today's Catholic and Orthodox denominations. I just love that. You're excommunicated. Oh, yeah? You're excommunicated. And then, <laughs> multiple kind of funny attempts have been made to heal the schism. Yeah, but the East the particularly Crusades. has remained set in their autonomy. Sure, the relationship between the denominations has seen some improvement and better civility since the Second Vatican Council in the 1960s, and the establishment of the Joint International Commission for Theological Dialogue between the Catholic Church and Orthodox Church in 1979. But the East and West churches still prevail as individual and autonomous branches of Christianity. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good stuff. Yeah, no, it's good to see. It's good to see them go back um, quite a bit. Let's talk about it some more. Okay, well, yeah, I got, you know, much of what I was, was hoping for, which was um, to see a little bit more before the 1054 official kind of mutual excommunication of the leaders on both sides. Um, but seeing, I guess just the big thing was that there were theological disputes going back many centuries. I mean, they were talking about that clear back in, um, uh, in the second century. And, and really, when you think about it, the, the church really became split when Constantine, uh, sorry, Constantine, Emperor Constantine, you know, uh, moved the capital over to the east. But, but I mean, you saw there were theological disputes before that, because happens um, before. But you would think by then, that's that's really when it's it's really changed. Is when the you know the the, the political seat is leaving Rome, and um, them still in the West trying to carry without maybe the political leadership, but having the church leadership still remain there out in the West in Rome itself. When again, so much political power is now shifted to the East. And along with that, of course, you know, religious influence because of the tie between the empire and the religion. And you saw that going through when Western Rome falls, that tie, like I was saying earlier with Justinian, um, having that tie still between the church and the empire um, being very closely related, if not joint, you know, like, like with these Byzantine emperors claiming um, religious authority over the church as well. So it's not, it's not a surprise that there was a split in the churches. Maybe it's a little bit interesting, the fact that it took so long to maybe make that official in a way. I mean, excommunication, I don't know if as part of that, I'd have to look at what was actually written in those excommunication letters, but did they say, okay, uh, we officially don't recognize you or we don't recognize ourselves as being a part of the same entity but was it more just your heretics were heretics not like hey there's two different branches of christianity going on so anyway nevertheless you have that now the catholic church in the west is going to have you know a similar thing kind of happen about 15 or sorry about 500 years later when you had to get the catholic or sorry the protestant reformation that comes up as a result of the early 1500s with martin luther and then you get a break off of that and then breaks off break off of that so it's kind of the you know uh, history of a lot of religions um having these schisms they happen all the time islam went through the same thing between the sunni and shiites and then there's schisms within the schisms you know even deeper within shia and deeper within sunni so it's just a part of religion 
that especially when you have these religions that are so large when it comes to geography and how they're spread and when they are multicultural like it's happening in christianity and happened in islam these things kind of seem to be inevitable because cultural traditions play into religious beliefs and religious uh um, practices as well so yeah not necessarily surprised but i always like that story at the end where they're they both excommunicate each other you know both claiming that they are the uh they themselves are the ones with the authority and that excommunicating them will actually do anything which it really doesn't because it's like you know you're excommunicated by somebody that you don't actually believe as a true authority it doesn't really do much for you other than try to embolden your own position against the other all right well anyway this was great um the original video is down below definitely uh give it another look and check out the other knowledge stuff knowledge does some awesome videos like this very good good stuff great production values definitely recommend it so please um do that for them but again just another shout out uh join our patreon if you'd like to vote on some other videos join our discord server gaming community i have a gaming youtube channel mr terry gaming mr terry history on twitch um a bunch of other fun stuff down below and we'll see you next time bye